recording. So thank you so much, everybody who um, were able to, are able to come here today. This is our first webinar in our My R Summer Webinar Series, which is centered around the R Studio Instruction Certification process. So to kick this off, we wanna just, we wanted to have a webinar over the whole process um, itself. So we have Greg, who is the instructor for the R Studio Certification Program. And then we also have Yanina and Shell, who also are members of our panel discussion. Forgot to mention that this is a panel discussion on this R Studio certification process. And both Yanina and Shell, they actually went through the certification themselves. And they are going to talk about just um, their experiences in um, the process of doing that. So does, um, can our panelists give an introduction um, we'll start off with Greg and then just move on to Yanina and then Shell. Sure. My name is Greg Wilson. I'm a member of the education team at our studio. Uh, I'm probably best known for being the co-founder of Software Carpentry. Um, and yes, this is a COVID beard. And yes, I do comb it. <laughs> All right, Yanina. <laughs> I never know what to say. Well... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Mayar, Loris, and Danielle for the invitation. And um, just want to you to know this is my first time speaking in English in public. So I ask you, <laughs> you to please bear with me. Uh, I promise I am I am smarter in Spanish, uh, but I will try to do my best. Thanks, Yanina. That was nice. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shelmith, based in Nairobi, Kenya, um, one of the co-organizers of Nairobi R, and I also happen to be part of the core team at Africa R, um, and I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, and just a special thanks to our panelists for um, taking the time out of their busy days to participate in this webinar. So we're going to first um, learn about what is all involved in the R Studio certification instructor certification process. So Greg has a presentation that he would like to give. Okay, let me do that. Thumbs up if you can see my screen. All right, because video conferencing is much harder than data science. All right, so thank you very much for the introduction, Doris. I'm Greg, you've met Yanina and Shelmuth. And what we're here to talk about today is our studio's instructor training and certification process. And this is the why. People need training, they need a wide variety of training, but the people giving the training need to be trained as well. I think that almost all of us know <coughs> basic facts about public health. We know what vitamins are, what germs are, but we don't know similar basic facts about how people learn. And and the irony is that a lot of groups exist to help people learn how to program, but most of the people who teach through them have taught themselves how to teach or they're imitating the teachers they've had. You only need to know a few things to be a more effective teacher. And so we've tried to boil that down into a short training course followed by some exams so that we can help people find the trainers that they need. And they might be looking for those in a wide variety of ways. I don't know enough about veterinary medicine or agriculture to run a data science class for people who are veterinarians or concerned about agriculture, but we have people in our community who do. Location is a little less important now than it was before COVID because so much teaching has moved online, but only a little bit less. I don't know what the challenges are doing data science in Kenya or in Argentina. Shelmuth and Yanina do. And time zones are always going to matter. Level of instruction, do you want basic? Do you want advanced? Do you want incredibly complicated statistical methods? Or are you just looking for a way to get a regression line out of this? Different people will teach at different levels. And finally, there's always the question of price. Some people simply can't afford high price trainers. And a lot of that varies by geography and by research domain and so forth. 
the more trainers we have, the more people's needs we'll be able to satisfy. So the history of all of this is I started developing an instructor training program when I was at Software Carpentry from 2010 onwards, um, made a lot of mistakes, got a lot of things wrong, but we eventually settled on a two day format. When our studio decided to start offering training and certification, we launched it at our studio conf in January of 2019. We've made a few changes since, it primarily moved almost all of the training online instead of doing it in person. We've run 30 classes over the last 18 months for 362 people. Of those, 119 have finished certifying for Tidyverse. Some of those have also certified for Shiny. Why is that number so low? 119 over 362 looks like a pretty low pass rate. Well, the answer is that only about half of the people who do the training go on to attempt the exams. And even those who do, there's often a lag of several months while they brush up on their technical skills or just try to find time in their calendar. And given that most of these classes have run in the last eight months, I'm not surprised by this lag. So why would people do the training and not bother to certify? Because what they really want to do is be better trainers. They're not so fussed about whether they're listed on our website, whether they're at their university or at their company, they just want to be able to deliver training more effectively. Where are they? Well, they're concentrated where our studio's customers are, perhaps unsurprisingly, Western Europe and North America, but we're seeing a growing number in other places. Um, we've got several in Argentina. We have others in progress in Colombia, Venezuela, Chile, and Brazil. We have three instructors in Africa so far and another half dozen who are in various stages of completing. The biggest gaps we have though are in Asia. We don't have any certified instructors in either China or India. We don't have any in Japan. We only have one in Korea. We have several in Indonesia, one in Thailand. And one of the things I want to do in the coming 12 months is reach out more to groups that are in that part of the world and start filling in some of these blanks. How does it work? Well, first thing is the course. I'll be talking about that in the next slide. Once you're through that, you have to do one exam on teaching, plus one exam on each of the technical topics you wanna to certify for. So if you're only interested in certifying as a Tidyverse instructor, you have two exams to do. If you only want Shiny, you do the teaching exam and the Shiny exam. If you wanna certify for both subjects, you only have to do the teaching exam once. Once you're certified, we'll add you to the trainer's directory online. That's where we steer customers who are looking for trainers. There's a Slack channel. We have occasional webinars as well for people who are certified. And you'll get free licenses for all of our professional products for use in teaching. So if you want to stand up our Studio Server Pro or something like that to teach a class, we'll give you the license for free. Please note that doesn't mean that we're giving you free access to our Studio Cloud. We're bringing in pricing for our Studio Cloud for education starting this September, I believe. And because we're paying for the hosting charges, we can't make that free indefinitely for people who are then using it to teach. Right? But for our professional products, where what we're giving you is access to the software, absolutely we wanna do whatever we can to support you. So how does the course work? An ideal group online is eight to 12. I've done it for as many as 16 people, but I don't like classes that large because it becomes impossible for me to interact with everyone. At eight people, even a dozen people, I can call on everyone at least a couple of times each day. By the time it's up to 16, some people are just gonna get missed out. I have run classes larger. I'm trying really hard not to do that again because at 25 or 30 people, the video conferencing doesn't work. The shared Google Doc stops being responsive. The technical challenges kick in. The class is three sessions on three successive days. So a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We don't try to do it once a week for three weeks. It seems to be much easier for people to schedule if we do half days for three consecutive days. And it's actually a half day, a half day, and then a couple of hours on day three. We do it as half days rather than full days because it gives you the rest of your time to deal with family emergencies, crisis at work, paper needs to go in, flood in the basement, whatever. We've tried doing it as one long day. 
people are exhausted by the end of it. And, you know, everybody can find an afternoon or a morning, but trying to block out a whole day and set everything else aside. I think that was difficult even before quarantine. All of the materials are freely available online under a Creative Commons license. Uh, you can follow this link. I'll be sharing these slides with Doris. She'll share them out to the group. You can reuse all of this material any way you want. You can incorporate it into your own lectures, anything and everything. You just have to cite us as the original source. Just give us a link back. And if you want a more complete version, the teachtogether.tech site collects everything that I've learned over the last few years about teaching. And I just want to give a shout out that Yanina and her colleagues are translating it into Spanish. And starting this week, we have somebody doing a Korean translation as well, which means I have to go back and fix all of the mistakes in the original English version, but there you go. So what do the exams look like? Each of the exams is 90 minutes long and you'll do it individually with me. You'll just put an entry into my calendar We'll hop on Zoom for 90 minutes. You'll screen share with me as you go through some questions about Tidyverse or Shiny, or you teach a demo lesson for 15 minutes and then answer a few questions in a Google Doc for the teaching exam. There are sample exams up on the RStudio Education blog if you want to get an idea for the questions. The short version is the teaching exam covers stuff that's in the teaching course. If you're doing Tidyverse, the R for data science book is everything you need to know. There is nothing on the exam that isn't in that book. And if you're doing the shiny exam, there's nothing in the exam that isn't in the current draft of the new book, Mastering Shiny, which isn't out yet, but you can, it's almost finished and it's up on the website. We're not exploring the stranger corners of R and the Tidyverse and shiny. We're not trying to trick people the questions all focus on things that you would reasonably cover in an introductory one or two day workshop on the Tidyverse or on Shiny. What does it cost? Nominally, it's $500 US for the course and for each exam. So the total is about $1,500. However, it's $100 for each item for people in less affluent areas. And we are giving complete fee waivers to a lot of people. We recognize that this is a difficult time for a lot of people. So we're trying to make it as accessible as possible. $1,500 for certification would just put it out of reach of far too many people. When you fill in the form, and I'll throw the link into the Zoom chat, you can tell us if you think you need a fee waiver and give the reasons why. We're trying to be as generous as we can. And there's more information at that link there. But if you go to education.rstudio.com slash trainers, you'll see the directory and all of the other information. A few questions that come up before we hand over to the panelists. We have an FAQ online. How much demand is there for training? There's lots. One of the reasons we set this program up is that we can't keep up as a company and I don't think any individual can keep up. You all know that data science is growing and growing and growing and people want all kinds of training in all kinds of places from all kinds of people. Is this program only for people in industry? Absolutely not. About a third of our certified instructors are either faculty or on their way to becoming faculty at colleges and universities. We're, we're trying to reach everybody. Um, a lot of other people have certified so that they can do a better job of teaching evening workshops and weekend workshops as volunteers. We're very happy to support that too. Do you have to teach a specific curriculum? No. We use the material from R for data science because we know it, but we fully expect people to develop their own lessons for their particular audiences, not just because of language differences, but because of different domains, different backgrounds, different problems, different focus. You know your communities better than we ever can. We will help you build curriculum. I'm happy to review lessons for people. Other instructors are happy to do that as well. We want a diversity of curriculum. If you've taught R for the carpentries, then you don't have to do our course. You can go straight to the exams. If you're already a certified instructor with the carpentries and you've taught at least one R workshop, we're not gonna make you repeat the training course. There's enough overlap that you can go straight to demonstrating your technical proficiency. The bad news is the waiting list. It's currently several months. We've got quite a few people on the waiting list. We're running classes as quickly as we can. 
but for example, right now, if you wanted to book an exam with me, my first opening is August because everything has piled up. We're trying to clear that as much as we can. Excuse me just one second. And then one last question before we hand over to the panel. I always get asked this in training, so I figured I'd throw this out now. How much should you charge for training? Nobody ever knows the first time they do commercial training what they should ask. I'm not allowed to tell you, and in fact, it will vary a lot from place to place, but you can do a little bit of math. And if I can take a minute, I'd like to run through that. If you attended our studio conf in San Francisco in January this year and did a workshop, you would have paid $1,500 for a two day workshop. There would have been round numbers, 40 people in the room. That works out to $60,000 for two days or $30,000 for one day. Now, the venue is going to take a chunk of that. The organizers are going to take a chunk of that to cover administrative costs and the Wi-Fi and the catering and everything like that. The numbers vary widely, but I think it's fair to say do a three-way split. That means you're making about $10,000 for teaching 40 people for one day. But that number is misleading because it doesn't include all of the time it took you to develop that training material. If you think that you can put together a good one day course in a couple or three weeks, that changes the number significantly, but you're still earning a pretty decent living by doing training. The downside always used to be the travel. If you were teaching commercially, you had to go to client sites. These days, all of a sudden, they're much more comfortable with training being done online. So you take the travel out of the equation, this is a pretty good gig. Right. That brings me to the end of what I wanted to say. And what I'd like to do now is hand over to people who've actually gone through this so that they can tell you all the stuff that I kind of glossed over. So Doris, can I give you back the mic? Yes, thank you, Greg, for that very good explanation on our studio instructor certification process. Um, so now, um, I'm going to ask um, Yanina and Shell some questions. Um, I gave them three questions to um, think about. So um, we're going to start off with the first one. Um, and we'll just start off with Yanina. Um, why did you decide to go through the certification process? Um, well, I have, I have been teaching programming for 24 years now. <laughs> But I have never had any formal training as a teacher until I became our studio certified. Um, I wanted to become certified to back my work up as a teacher. Uh, I want to be able to show people that my teaching is of good quality. Uh, and I believe the our studio certification did that for me. Uh, once I became certified, uh, I was able to be in touch with other certified teachers. Uh, that means uh, I am now part of a support network and I have access to the most advanced resources and, and update. Uh, R as a language is not just a programming language for me, it is a community and this is part of that. All right, thank you. So now it's your turn, Shell. Um, you're on mute. Huh. <laughs> Sorry. Just as Janina mentioned, um, I also have been training, but then I've never received any formal training on how to be a trainer. So I just le needed to learn a lot from the process. And though maybe I'll talk about this later, I, I loved learning things such as how to, how to take feedback. I was always someone who didn't want negative feedback. I thought negative feedback was all about people being against me, you know? Like, I, I put all my effort in this, but um, after some time, uh, after getting the certification, I was like, you know what? Feedback is welcome. Um, yeah, so the other thing, I just wanted to show my friends and rather Africans in general, um, and no offense to anyone, but I, I feel we have as, like, 
our skills are as those that are in the international world. You know, I just wanted to show people, imagine what we do at home is the same. Like, it's, it's the same things people are doing outside. And at least the exam made it, uh, confirmed that because the exam was just things I used to do even before certification. So I, I was really happy um, to go through that. We also had also been employed at a place and I was so stressed. I was so stressed. I, I just needed something different. I remember I just st emailed Greg and I was like, you know what, I'm going through a hard time. Um, when are you having the next certification process, um, classes? I want to be part of that. I need something positive in my life. Um, again, I, I was very motivated when I saw Ahmado. Ahmado is a Malian from Senegal on the list. And I was like, hey, if Ahmado can do it, I can also do it. Um, but yeah, for me, that was the thing. I, I just wanted to, I don't know, just be in sync with um, everything and also meet amazing people who are doing, who are working with our um, international employer. Yeah. Thank you. So now we're going to move to the second question, which is probably um, also like a question that everybody is wondering. Um, what did you do to prepare? So we'll start out with Yanina. Yeah, well, uh, I was lucky to go through this process with a group of our ladies from Argentina and Chile. Uh, we had weekly meetings. Uh, each week, a person was responsible for reading and preparing a class with a chapter from the book, Alphabet Science. Uh, that person explained it for the rest of the group. We also solved the exercises together and discussed them. Uh, the rest of the group uh, has to read the, the whole chapter before our meeting. And this process takes us several months, but I learn a lot and I enjoy it a lot. Uh, as, as you are going to learn if you do the training, <laughs> you learn better together. So if you can do this with people, you enjoy spending time together. And for the exams, once uh, it was time for the, the certification teaching exam, uh, we prepare the required materials, and then we uh, practice our class by teaching it to other people in the group. Uh, we gave each other feedback uh, on our teaching so we can improve our lesson. And this practice helped us, for example, to make the lesson last 50 minutes, uh, to make sure that the lesson was accessible that we all use Zoom well to teach. We don't know about Zoom. <laughs> it was in December of last year, this. Uh, or that we use the pedagogical tools correctly. Uh, and because no lesson survives the first meeting with that student, this practice process helped us <laughs> to make sure that Greg was on our first student <laughs> during the teaching exam. Uh, and it's working, we all passed. <laughs> I'm also asked for give the exam in Spanish for obvious reason. And I was Ian, uh, the person who took my exam, and he was great, as great. And we have, I feel really comfortable giving the exam. If I could just jump back in on that, uh, I should have mentioned this. We can do exams in English, Spanish, and French at the moment. If you're most comfortable teaching in some other language, let me know and I can see if we can find somebody from the RStudio staff who's able to supervise an exam in that language. Thank you for that, um, Greg. Um, so, um, Shell, how did you prepare for the exam? Um, for me, I think, oh, not I think I know, sorry. I was lucky enough, I had been using Tidyverse since 2017. But there's always that feeling that, uh, am I actually very ready, you know? So um, I had to go through Hadley's R4DS book, which is so amazing. Um, and the good thing, it's available online. So I just um, brushed off just to see, um, just to remind myself about little tiny things. Um, and then I also went through the slides the instructors give us, uh, used to um, teach us, which is good, um, although with the slides, there is always like some information that you need like I needed to learn more about some of these concepts so I took Greg's book um, and I was very happy to go through it um, 
and it explains some of the things we'd been taught in in depth you know some things i would um, find myself googling just to see how some concepts apply in some um, different fields but um, yeah i think those are the two the slides greg's book and um hadley's r4ds book but also having to practice because one thing with us people who code is that you find yourself maybe you copy pasted some code somewhere maybe two two years ago and you've always been using that as a template you know when i want to maybe start a new project i'll always don't save us don't save us um until someone comes and asks you okay write this from scratch um sorry i hope i won't give out the exam details in this call but um when someone tells you uh to do something i'm like oh my god where the hell does that code go um but yeah i think for me those are the things i um, did i i didn't have as much as i went through this class with other people including doris and daniel daniel sorry um i didn't we didn't have a chance to uh, study in groups as um yanina and um her friends so I, I did it alone um again one of the rules of this exam is that you're not supposed to give out details about it per se um and i think you people are lucky right now there are sample exams during the time when i was taking the exam <sighs> There was no sample exam. You could not ask Greg what he's testing. You know, you, I was just so in the dark and I was like, in Kiswahili, there's something we say, come on, buy and buy, even my best. Um, but yeah, that's how I prepared. And now um, the final question to ask the panel, um, how has getting the certification been helpful to you professionally? So we'll start with Yanina. Um, well, I, I have been able to apply the pedagogical tools immediately in my teaching and in my work as a researcher. Uh, I use all I learned to teach R, but also for other topics, uh, for example, how to use and interpret weather radar data. Um, I, I also use the pedagogical tools I learned beyond teaching. Uh, I lead a research group of digital agricultural technology, and we have been using the learner personas concept. And um, when we discuss a new product, we use concept maps to organize our approach uh, and to assign responsibilities. Uh, creating concept maps need agreement, so we talk a lot. Um, we use all these tools to keep our final user in mind. If you are not familiar yet with concept maps or learner personas, Greg can explain that for you in this panel. <laughs> I can explain in Spanish. <laughs> and finally, uh, my newest passion is also based on our studio education work. Uh, at the beginning of lockdown due to COVID-19, I got together with other our studio and carpentry certified trainers and instructors and started Metadocencia. Metadocencia means uh, meta teaching in English. Uh, Metadocencia is a Spanish-speaking teachers community that we started because we understood that COVID reality, Spanish-speaking educators needed tools and knowledge to teach online. Uh, it was oceans. Uh, we have all these amazing resources, knowledge, and experience. So we are teaching Spanish-speaking teachers how to teach online based on Greg's and Carpentry's material. We do it for free because we believe this is a way to transform the world. Um, Metadocencia is what I'm most proud of at the moment. Thank you for that. Um, and now, um, Shell. Um, just to build up on what Yanina has said, the concept of learning person, learner personas is really, uh, really important. Because I remember some last year I was holding a training and the training was a mixture of uh, students who are still in school, students who had graduated having done a different course, um, some managers who are working in different companies, um, you know, and I taught them as one, which somehow, I don't know, kind of doesn't work. Um, that was one big thing. I also learned, I know I've been preaching this forever and maybe Greg is tired of listening to it, but I loved the concept of concept maps, um, how you're able to design your training visually um so that you're able to know like you just avoid you just avoid um 
teaching students so much at a go, you know, just bits called chunking, teaching people uh, bits and bits of um, lessons or giving people small, small bits of material. Um, and sometimes you just have so much in your head, like you will want to teach everything, but there's no time. And if you don't sort yourself out or kind of come up with a roadmap, it will be really difficult. Again, as I mentioned before, um, I, I learned how to receive feedback. I remember after that, I had a training in one of the universities in Kenya. And once my training was done, before I left the room, I, I quickly created a Google form asking people to tell me what they loved about the training, what they didn't love, um, what, how I should improve. And I got, um, I got feedback. I remember it was one of the kind of negative but positive um, feedback I got was I'm too fast. So I've received that a lot. Um, sometimes I, I'm just trapping and... Some students are, um, I don't want to say slow, but I don't know which word Greg used, I'm sorry. Um, there's a word he used, like, um, not everyone is able to get content at the same uh, pace, so that, that was good. I also la learned how to, like, the importance of having formative assessments versus summative assessment. You know, you can't just train, 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 and then at the end of the day, you're like, okay, let me test your knowledge. You know, you have to test people as you go because maybe you left someone the first 10 minutes, you know, and if someone is lost in the first 10 minutes, um, the rest of the class ends up being very, such a disaster, um, rather. Yeah, also, um, for me, it's, this may not be professional per se, but it has helped me be, become able to mentor other people because um, sometimes I just get a lot of DMs from people, um, especially in Kenya, Africa, just asking me stuff, you know, and I feel as though right now I can be a role model to tell people, imagine I did it. Um, I'm on this list of, I call it the wall of fame. I'm over here, look at me, and I'm just, I'm just a normal person we, we, we hang out with you guys all the time. So people have had the courage to seek information about the training because before we didn't know, you know. And then um, also people are just more excited learning R, um, learning Tidyverse, learning all these um, R concepts. And then, I don't know, it also gave me um, an opportunity to advance my skills on shiny because i also want a second photo on that website. um so if just advancing my shiny skills have changed documentation is better um everything is on the internet I th the, the the package itself has improved um so yeah <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for um, giving your insights, Janina and Shell. Um, I'm going to move this to Danielle, in which um, she is going to um, ask some of the most frequently asked questions that we received when people registered for this webinar. So take it away, Danielle. Thanks, Doris. Thank you, Shell, Greg, and Janina. Um, Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm Danielle, and uh, yeah, I just want to ask me a couple of the questions, um, and you all kind of covered most of them, but uh, maybe some of the questions that weren't yet covered. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we had a question about the level of expertise um, needed to take the training course. Uh, maybe Greg, if you could speak to that. Sure. Um if you think about the material that you would cover in an introductory class on stats using R, if you can tidy up some data, if you can you know, join a couple of tables, do a ggplot visualization, as I said during my presentation, we're not diving into the dark and scary corners of lazy evaluation. Um, we're not asking you to work with date formats. You're welcome. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that you wouldn't cover in an intro class. Do you need to know how to fit a, a regression line to a bunch of points in a scatter plot? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, do you need to be able to rewrite the per library from scratch and make it four times as efficient as ours? No, you don't need to do that. If it's not in R for data science, it won't be on the tidyverse exam. Can I ask a follow-up to that? 
Yep, so since you're about to do the exam. I, I getting there. I, I did one. Ex, that's I did one exam, but not the tidy worst one yet. Um, what about the tidy models section of so, the book? So we are not. So for those who haven't met it, Tidy Models is a new initiative that's bringing together a lot of the modeling packages to make them more uniform. There were a lot of historical differences between different modeling packages and people like Max and Julia Silvi and others have done a really good job of just making that stuff more accessible, but it isn't completely stable yet. There are still changes happening and we've only had ourselves experience of teaching it a handful of times. So there's nothing from tidy models on the exam because I don't know where to point people for teaching that yet. Okay. Cause there was a section in R for data science on modeling. Yes. So, and it sticks to things like the LM function that have been there for several years. And there's, I think there's always going to be this lag. We have to teach the new stuff, but it takes us a while doing that before we know how best to teach it. And, I'm not going to examine it on whether you can teach it the right way until I'm confident we know what the right way is. And we're at least a year away from that for tidy models. Danielle threw a link in. Um, please check it out. It's a beautiful website and, and some beautiful software. I think it'll make your life better. Yeah, please do check out that, uh, that link. I think it was recently, um, the tidy models kind of uh, vignette was recently redone and it's Great <laughs> personal experience just walking through it. Um, just a great introduction to tidy models, I think, too. Um, so I've got a couple of other questions, but one actually just came in in the chat. So I'm going to ask, let's see here. Can anyone comment on how many workshops? Yeah, that's a good question. On average, that they deliver or have delivered, I guess, since um, becoming certified. And so um, any then shelf if you want to maybe comment on that and then maybe Greg if you can just speak from uh, prior experience working with other trainers uh, well in my case uh, due to COVID-19 I'm actually teaching more workshops now than what I did before um, <laughs> I delivered 25 workshops until now from the beginning of the year until this wow. day because of Metadocencia, most of them um, are the same workshop. Mm -hmm. And I delivered three about radar data, I work with that kind of data, and some others about data science in agricultural sector. Uh, so I enjoy it a lot <laughs> and I practice it. <laughs> I, I made the learner personas for each, each of the workshops. And it's really, really nice when you tell the people uh, on what person are you thinking when you build, and these people recognize themselves there. Uh, it's, the motivation is amazing. Uh, uh, you set the, the, a really good mood for the rest of the workshop. I love doing that. Uh, it's, it's really nice. It's awesome. Well, Nina's staying very busy giving these workshops. That's great. Uh, what about you, Shell? Uh oh. Uh, Shell, I think you are still muted. <laughs> Once I got certified in Jan, um, I, I took a group of ladies, around seven ladies, and I took them through the whole data analytics process for three months. Two, two and a half about that time. Um, and I, I applied a lot of the things I had um, learned in the process. Um, I also gave a workshop sometime. And then also yesterday, I took some guys through our special. So um, I think given that things are still ish and I'm managing a lot of people, I've not been able to um, lead many workshops like Yanina. <laughs> but, but the future is bright. <laughs> That's good. That's great. Um, we got another question. Um, can anyone speak to uh, how the certification might benefit academic instructors or tenure faculty? I apologize. Um, I can speak to that. Um, in several ways. One is that 
many educational instu institutions these days are looking for some sign of industry experience or industry relevance. They're not really sure what that means, but this can help with that in the same way that years ago being certified by a company like Microsoft or Sun as a systems engineer was useful. We, we're not really sure what it means, but we've heard of that company. Good. Right. So as one more thing to go into a portfolio, the second comment I would make, and I apologize if I'm giving offense to anyone, I have seen a lot of the training that various universities in Europe and North America give people on how to teach. And most of it actually isn't about how to teach. It's how to use the grade submission system. Right? It's how to use Moodle, not how to design a lesson. If you want to learn how you actually build a lesson and how you deliver it, most faculty are just thrown in at the deep end. They, they aren't taught that. And yet, it is probably the single biggest chunk of their time in their first few years. Anything we can do to help you do that more efficiently that frees up more time for your research, for your graduate students, for your family, for taking a break, anything we can do to make you a more efficient teacher, I think helps your career. And the feedback we've had is that, yeah, this stuff does help. And the third comment, and again, I don't want to give offense to people. Um, I think higher education is under a lot of strain and that's not going to get better anytime soon. We see a growing number of people who are in graduate school who realize that there just aren't as many faculty positions available as there were 20 or 30 years ago. And the ones that are, the competition is so much fiercer, it's going to take longer and it's going to, to cost you more in terms of sacrifices in your personal life. A, a lot of people look at that and decide that they would like to do the research, they would like to do the teaching, they just don't want to be doing it at a university. I was a professor for three years and four months and I am, I think happier and making a bigger contribution outside of formal academia. It, it, it isn't an either or choice, right? And, and this will help with that, right? Being recognized by a company like our studio can help you get that first gig, right? Can help you start to build the contacts you need if this is something you want to do either as a full-time business or as a way to make contacts that turn into consulting or as a way to get your foot in the door if you want to be hired by a company. And I've got examples of it playing out for people in all of those different ways. Thanks, Will. That's really helpful also just bridging the gap between industry and academia and how you can uh, use a certification as a, as a tool um, to do just that. Um, I have, we've got some questions coming in the chat. Um, I do want to get to maybe two more um, questions that were previously asked during the week. Um, so let's see here. Um, there was a question asked about how long, just kind of like study-wise, uh, maybe this is for you, Nina and Shell, how long it took you all to feel prepared um, before, um, yeah, before taking the exams? Well, in my case, it was uh, several months uh, because we read and group our four years. We also have in Spanish thanks to a group of people who translate the book. Um, and I was working with Tidyverse uh, from like five years before. And I have a computer science degree. Uh, so I, uh, all the things that has to do with joints and relational databases uh, is part what I was doing uh, a lot of years, uh, but I don't feel confident until I read the entire book. <laughs> um, I practice, I resolve all the exercises, um, and I practice this with this amazing group of our ladies, which I studied together. And as Greg say, they, it is true, they're not going to uh, took you any topic outside the book, that is true. Um, the, 
the way of the exams, uh, thinking that someone is watching you, your screen, maybe is stressful, but uh, I feel really comfortable. I have these things, of, oh my God, this man is going to see that I Google, I copy and paste the code and I modify and he really doesn't know. <laughs> Come on, we, we all do that, yeah, we all do it. <laughs> even professional programmers, okay? <laughs> so uh, when you feel comfortable, uh, which we're accomplishing with a few minutes, uh, you can code and you feel your coding like every other day. I use the help uh, in R, I use the help in our studio, I consult my cheat sheets. Um, and you can do that during the exam, so that's maybe can relax a little. And when I have some doubts about what the point of the exam were asking me, I asked Greg to clarify. So he did. Um, every single with smooth. Uh, really. I think that you read the book, you did the exercises, and maybe you can practice a little more after you do that. Uh, you are going to be ready. Thanks. Um, for okay, for me, I I think I took two weeks, um, but it's just because I needed to learn more about um, teaching. Um, again, I was very lucky in 2017. Um, after finishing my masters and lecturing for around two years, I got a chance to work for a company and all we could do was manipulate data, come up with graphs, manipulate data, come up with graphs. And I remember in 2017, uh, one of my directors approached me and they're like, Shalmi, do you know the piping operator? Science. And then he made, I'm like, oh, I saw that sign somewhere on Twitter. Um, but anyway, so I've been working with Tidyverse, so I just needed to refresh my skills. Um, so yeah, it just only took two weeks to read Greg's book, um, which is different. Anyway, I think the time is different for different people. Someone else will book the exam the next day, you know, like these things, it's okay, let's do it. So I think it depends on um, how comfortable you are, how available you are, because I was available. I didn't have a job. Um, yeah, it, it, it totally uh, depends, but there's one thing Greg, Greg, I think you give this one statement. You say that if I can't remember, um, people, I think people take exams even after six months. I think it's flexible. Um, there's no much cap on time. I think it's really flexible. So it's not that once the training ends that you're supposed to take the exam there and then. Um, and I think no one should pressure any, anyone to do that. I have some classmates who are taking the exams just at their own pace, which is totally fine. Um, yeah. And just to speak to that, um, what Yanina was saying, let me tell you, I, I, I believe I'm very confident, but once someone is watching what you're coding, the sweat is, I don't know, like you even forget what a data frame is for a minute. Like, oh my God, I'm so tense. But that's the good thing with having an awesome um, examiner. It's like, shall me just relax. Like, I got this. I got this. I'm going to do it. So yeah, um, it, it's such an amazing process. Um, I wanted to speak, I wanted to answer a question I've seen on the chat. Um, how will the training certification help a statistics master student get a start in the work domain? I think I've taught such people. Um, and, and the good thing about training is you become better at it. Think of it as just perfecting your skills, you know? Um, while you're training, like yesterday I was giving a training and I realized, oh my God, that is why this, this is this, because, you know, and if, if you're a master student, just gathering your colleagues, um, the, your friends, training them something small, let's say TIDR, the, the new TIDR, the new TDR functions, you know, pivot longer and pivot wider, you become a master of it. And and I will speak for Kenya, especially because I, I remember um, I got a job and they were asking me to do SPSS because of one, two, three. I was like, no, R is better because of one, two, three. And, you know, the things you get from training um, and training effectively, because once you train well, the first one, you get encouraged to train another and another. So 
yeah, I think that's important. In on the question of internet in Africa, Gwen, um, I don't think that's the case because sometimes we may think the the issue is internet, but people are still watching movies on Netflix comfortably and it's the same it's the same internet rather. Um definitely there's some places where internet is weaker, but um for me I think it, it's just the requests I get and we are also trying to spread R in Africa. You know, um, here a lot of people, especially in Kenya, use Excel as PSS. There are those who use R definitely, but they're not really out there. It's, it's not known in the public domain. So someone will reach out to me via LinkedIn. They're like, hi, I will want you to take, um, to train um, maybe my colleagues or my students, one, two, three, but we just have to take it um, slowly. Um, yeah. Thank you, Shell. Um, I'm gonna actually pass it over to Greg. I think you wanted to introduce someone. To the yeah. So the last thing I'd like to say, because I know we're coming up on the top of the hour, training isn't the only way to get into industry. And when I was a grad student, I simply didn't understand most of the other possibilities. Um, we have Katie Massiello with us, who's part of the customer success team at our studio. If you'd asked me when I was in my 20s, what is customer success, I wouldn't have known. But analyzing data or teaching how people how to analyze the data isn't the only thing you can do in data science. Katie, can you talk a little bit about what you do and how you got into it? Yeah, happy to. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, it's it's funny, Greg, because if if you'd asked me a year and a half ago what customer success was, I would have given you a blank stare as well. Um, so <laughs> just just for background, um, I've been on the R Studio team for just over a year um, in this customer success role. And prior to that, um, I'm, I'm an engineer at heart. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, and I spent my whole career um, in the aerospace industry, um, and getting into data science um, with uh, statistical and reliability analysis. So I sort of fell into data science, um, probably like maybe many of you um, um, have. And I, I realized that um, working with data and figuring out problems and um, doing analyses, I mean, like that lit up that part of my brain that I think video games light up for people, right? You, 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 you hit, you hit Apple return on a little line of code and it runs. <laughs> yeah, it's going. Yeah, right? I and I found that um, yeah. what I really enjoyed most in my, um, in my old job wasn't so much actually solving the problems, but sharing what I'd learned with other people. Right. Um, when I, when I first picked up our markdown and saw like, whoa, look what we can do with this. We need to be doing this everywhere. We need to solve these problems with this. Let's just revolutionize everything we're doing in the organization. This can solve all of our problems. I, I, I kept picking up that role where I was this person that was trying to share best practices and teach new things and, and help people figure out like, hey, if I can figure this out, you can figure this out. Let's transform things together. Um, and so this role in customer success that I've picked up is, is all about that. Um, it's working with our professional customers in the R Studio um, professional products to help them solve problems um, in a bigger way. And it's not necessarily the nitty gritty of like, how am I going to make my shiny app run faster? Um, it's more like, how are we going to get this thing to production and support a load of, you know, people pinging this from all over the world and the thing not crashing? Or how can we take this problem and solve it or on a broader scale? Um, so my focus on my day-to-day -day working with customers is really about relationships, um, a passion for what kind of problems they're trying to solve, having the technical ability to like, oh yeah, shiny, I know that thing, I've heard of that. Or I can help you, you know, get some um, pointers or resources to other things to solve these problems. Um, but it's it's been a big part of just um, being an advocate and an ally for teams and having the ability to speak their language, but but also to be an advocate and a champion for them as well. I'm happy um, to answer any questions. You can feel free so to reach out to me on question. LinkedIn or yeah. So we're, we're, how did you find this job? I'm sorry, Doris is trying to jump in. Gonna... So I was just going to say we're running out of time. So, because, um, yeah. Um, so uh, we can just wrap up with this question. 
And then I'm just going to do a quick plug about some things. So sorry, everyone, for running a little late. But yeah, I just wanted to just keep, because I know some people are busy. So I'm sorry. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just give you the short, short answer then. It was all just about connections and, and meeting people and conversations, right? Using, so use your network and use your village and have conversations. And feel free to find me on LinkedIn or if you send an email to info at our studio and say, please share this message with KDM, it'll get to me. So happy to connect. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. So um, just um, thank you everybody for coming to our first webinar in our, um, our studio certification instructor series. Um, if you want to continue to get information about these webinars, um, please just join our MyR Slack and we will have the information. We will also have the recording of the webinar, but only available for our MyR members. And I just wanted to announce the um, next workshop, which Shell will be um, teaching on ggplot2, because uh, I was just talking to Shell about it. And yeah, <laughs> she was like, oh, well, I can get you ready. And I was like, all right, get me ready. So I just thought, hey, it'll be a good idea. We could all kind of just explore GG plot um, two. Because yeah, the focus for these webinars is to get you acquainted with the process, but then also do whatever, you know, focus on some main components of the exam. So Shell, thank you so much for doing it for me and everyone else. And the last last little bit is that I will send um, just like a follow up. Um, we shared a couple of links as grabbing some of the links as they were going by in the chat. So I'll, I'll send a follow up email um, after this with links um, where you can learn a little bit more about the training process. I'll make sure to include um, information about Africa R and then also, of course, um, joining my R. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for coming and spending some time with us. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Shell. And thank you, Anina. I really appreciate all the wisdom that you all shared and um, just, you know, resources for how to get certified as instructors. Oh, I had to unmute myself. Oops. Uh, um, at that, I'm going to stop the recording. And Greg said that he will stay on for a couple of minutes um, to answer any